So we've found out about Australia's emissions in a global context, and what we now need is the latest global warming science. So following that, we'll, we'll take a look at the latest global solutions. The, uh, the 10,000 years that we've had agricultural societies, the, the climate has been in a decent equilibrium. We've had a plus or minus of less than one degree, including the medieval warming period that we often hear about, and all those periods through the Holocene. So this 10,000 years uh, led to modern civilization as we know it. Uh, sea levels remained re relatively constant over this period and agricultural systems developed in, in the areas. Where we're heading, you can see on the right, is well out of this range and well above uh, historical norms, which were, which were colder. So we're heading for much warmer conditions if we continue to put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere like we have. So here's, um, here's what happens when you put uh, unabated you know, uh, human emissions into the atmosphere. We've got um, Vislav Malsvosky, he's the US Navy's lead oceanographer. So he's a, he's a Navy oceanographer, not a hippie, just a guy who works in an office studying his maps. Um, he's you know, a well-adorned well uh, postgraduate uh, university doctor. And uh, he is talking about his model of the Arctic's ice cover. And the Arctic's really interesting because it's a big, effectively a big reflector. And in winter, it's 13 million square kilometres. And in summer, it's normally 7 million square kilometres, or about the size of Australia. So it has this dynamic change between winter and summer. It goes to 13 million square kilometres in winter and down to 7 million square kilometres again in summer. And when light is striking the Arctic ice cover, 90% of it goes back out into the atmosphere, so you don't get any regional warming. Only 10% of the, the, the heat is retained uh, in, in the region. And since 2000, we've seen a really rap rapid reduction in that summer ice extent, or that summer ice cover. And in fact, between 2005 and 2007, we saw a 22% reduction um, to absolutely unbelievable historic lows. And that, and that reduction is the size of the Northern Territory, to put it in perspective. So a really huge reduction. And, um, and uh, basically, Vislav Malsvosky, his model, he suggested back in 2005, so long before anyone even noticed, that by 2013, there would be no more ice cover in the summer in the Arctic. And um, if you look there, the, the yellow line just shows you the 13 million square kilometre. Uh, no, no, it doesn't. It shows a 7 million square kilometre um, summer extent. And the green line shows you the, uh, the 2005 cover. And the, the uh, red line shows you what happened in 2007. Now, in 2008, the ice cover grew back about the size of Victoria. So it's actually, it was a larger extent, but the data that then came out from the, uh, from the ice thickness tests was that the ice, overall ice volume or ice mass had actually reduced. So what you actually had was thinner ice. <clears throat> and that's depicted here. So the red zone on the right, which is 2008, shows the one year ice. That's the ice that reformed uh, during the winter from the previous year, and then, and then, uh, will very easily melt again. So there's the perennial ice, there's a lot less perennial ice than, than in 2007 when there was a lot more perennial ice, which means that you sort of pass the tipping point and there'll be a rapid melt then the following season. Now, to give you an idea of where government uh, policy makers are thinking, they were looking at projections by the IPCC. And the IPCC had this range of projections that included a, a mean of a 2,100 loss of Arctic ice, as, as, as I mean there. And um, the most extreme case that they looked at was a 2,070 loss of ice. Now what's actually happened when you plot the observed is that the ice is rapidly melting towards somewhere between 2,000 and 2,020, consistent with Vislav Malsvosky's prediction, the US Navy oceanographer. So there we've got observed climate change, but no reaction from our political masters. And uh, so what's wrong with Arctic ice melt? Well, Arctic ice melt itself, most of it doesn't lead to sea level rise because it's, most of it's floating ice, it's not bermed on Earth. But right next to the Arctic is Greenland. And the Greenland, again, is millions of square kilometres of ice, but it's two kilometres thick, it's sitting on the Earth. In fact, it's so heavy that it depresses the Earth's crust 300 metres in, in the region. And um, here you can see that in 1992, 
the melt was only around the periphery of the Arctic, and in uh, 2005, the melt had advanced far inland, and so they're, they're going through some serious melting there. Now, the melting of, uh, of Greenland has been observed to be non-linear. So it's not just add heat and you get direct uh, melting and the water runs off. But in fact, what happens is the ice starts to break up. It changes, it shifts the weight around and you get ice quakes. And then the ice quakes and the movements cause earthquakes and then they have a rebound effect of ice quakes and you get this ongoing ice quake, earthquake phenomena, which then leads to the breakup and melt and the ice effectively slips off the, uh, off the Greenland uh, earth mass and into the sea, and that will raise sea levels. And five to seven metres of sea uh, is stored up on the Greenland ice sheet. And uh, we've got global shipping that can really only handle one to two metres of, of, uh, of sea, and we're very dependent on that uh, globally. That's how we uh, depend on that for food around the world, uh, for our material goods and things like that. So where should we go for advice on where, where, we, should, where we should aim? Well, Dr James Hansen from NASA, he's been looking into climate change uh, for many years. And in 1988, he was actually the first person to testify in front of US Congress. And uh, he gave them warnings over climate change. And uh, consistently, he's been really correct in those. And in fact, he's been uh, so on the ball and, and uh, so ad advancing the political process that during the Bush administration years, uh, he was censored. And uh, when he went to testify in front of Congress, they wanted to put lines through everything he wanted to say to change the wording so that climate change might be a problem instead of it is a problem and, and so on and so forth. Uh, what he did was, uh, just amazing, he then decided to go out and uh, say, I'm Dr James Hansen, I happen to work at NASA, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and uh, this is where the problem is. And uh, by doing that, he's been able to uh, maintain the focus of international campaigners and, and the policy makers who actually care about climate change. So he says that we've got too much carbon dioxide already in the atmosphere. And effectively, uh, he warns us that 450 parts per million, which is where policymakers are thinking at the moment, will lead us to a 75 metre sea level rise if maintained for long enough. And uh, what he says is that we need to go to 300 to 325 parts per million, which is similar to where we were during pre-industrial times. So he says today's levels, for instance, an equilibrium sea level rise for today's 385 parts per million, which was a comment he made the other year, is at least several metres. So several metres of sea level rise at 385 parts per million, which is the atmospheric carbon concentration uh, that we're at now. So we've got too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And if there's anything you go away from this talk with, you need to know that we've got too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere already. <clears throat> So to give you an idea of what this means, back in 1750, we had a safe climate. We were within that 10,000 year zone of climate equilibrium for the Holocene. <clears throat> and we had uh, 280 parts per million by volume in the atmosphere, which is 596 billion tonnes of carbon. In 1950, we hit 620 billion tonnes of carbon in the atmosphere. And we had 300 parts per million by volume. So that was the safe climate threshold. So that's the limit of where you'd want to take this uh, geological period that we live in at the moment, that's the limit of where you'd want to take that if you want to maintain that going forward. So if you want to live within the bounds of the kind of weather patterns and climate that we're used to in our agricultural systems, our food production is built around, that's, that's where you want to be. So in 2009, we hit 820 billion tonnes of carbon or 392 parts per million. And uh, we've sort of hit it into a zone that we can now call dangerous. And we're on the way to 450 parts per million. Now that's where European and IPCC policymakers want us to head. Um, the Rudd government, the Australian government, claims they want us to head there. However, their targets, if adopted internationally, would be more in line with heading us towards 550 or 650 parts per million. Um, wouldn't fit on my chart, so we'll just leave you with the European Union's targets and, uh, and Barack Obama's target there at 450 parts per million. So what we actually need to do, according to James Hansen from NASA, is take 200 billion tonnes of carbon, that's carbon debt, back out of the atmosphere. And the way we can do that is we can allocate historic carbon to the historic emitters.